Amen. Amen. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Mark 10? Mark 10. Mark 10. We're going to read verses 46 to 52. Thank you, Freddie. Can we give it up for Freddie? Mark 10, 46 to 52. Today, um, I, I kind of did this last week, but I'm, I'm just going to kind of preach it like I see it. Is that okay? So that just means I'm going to look at the text, and I'm going to let you know a few things. This is a really simple message today, but I just feel like there's some pertinent things that God wants to share with us today, and I believe that God is going to speak to his people. Do you believe that? And I believe that this is a message that it's less about what you write down and learn and more about what you catch. Um, some things are caught. Some things are taught. Hello? And today I believe this message about catching something. You know, we're in a season of not a cold, hopefully, or anything like that. But, um, um, but, but, but there are times we should catch things. And I pray that today you would catch faith, that you would, you, you would catch hope, that, that you, would, you, would, you would be expectant for what God is going to do. And if you're taking ti- notes, the title of this message is, I will wait expecting. Somebody say, I will wait expecting. So come on, so you say it better than that. I will wait expecting. Some of you look really angry. Again, I'm not sure why, but I will wait expecting. I will wait expecting. I'm going to check my face while I wait expecting. If you, if you always look mad at me when I'm speaking, it's, it's awkward. It's a little awkward. I'm going to be honest with you. Don't look so angry. Like, I, I love you. Um, I will wait expecting. I will wait expect. I'm believing God to do it. I'm not going to wait in fear. I'm not going to wait in anxiety. I'm not going to wait sad. I'm going to wait expecting for God to do something great. Amen? All right, so we're going to turn to Mark 10, and we're going to read a story of a man who has great expectation even though he is blind. Blind Bartimaeus. It says this in Mark 10, verse 46. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus says. Jesus asked. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his fight, his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Again, if you're taking notes, thank you so much for that. I will wait expecting. I will wait expecting. Does anybody like waiting? Anybody? Okay. I hate waiting. <laughs> Let's just be honest. I, thank you. I am the worst waiter. Like, I am not. A, look at my wife in the front row. This is so bad. She is like, I am not a good way. I, I have, I, I is not a gift. Patience, if you have not noticed, is not my gift. It is not a gift. Everyone's given gifts. We develop fruits of the Spirit. I am, this is my area of growth. Like, that's okay. Everyone's got their, I am not a great waiter. I don't like waiting for things. I feel like waiting for things is a waste of yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I, I, and then there are certain settings you put me in, and I am even worse at waiting. Like so much so, my wife and I, we, have, we, we, t- we go to counseling, marriage therapy, counseling we have for many years. Like, just so you know, it's okay. It's actually really good. Uh, some people are like, you only go when you're in trouble. No, it's good to go all the time. Like, we go, we maintenance, we got re- systems. We're going to talk about that next year. We're, we're building out a space called the living room. We do a lot of marriage stuff. It's going to be exciting. Anyway, I say all to say, My wife and I have been to therapy basically for this one situation. I am terrible in airports. 
So we're traveling. It's holidays, right? You go to the airport. I am the worst. I, I don't know what ha- the devil gets a hold of me in an airport. I, I have like issues in airports. Like I am the worst. And, and I've, I've literally had to put language to it so my wife and I don't get divorced. Not kidding. We've literally had to discuss why I have issues in airports. And I've found that there's two reasons why I have massive issues in airports. The first one is I cannot stand an abuse of power. I love you, but if you work in an airport, I just feel like it's one of the most abusive places in the world. I feel like there's people, and they feel like they have so much power, and they really don't. Okay? They really don't. I know where they live. They live up the block from me. They don't, they're not that much more powerful. But in the airport, it just feels like they're controlling a situation that really they should not be controlling the way that they are. And it feels like an overstep and an overreach of power. And I cannot be in an environment like that. It really bothers me. But on top of that, to make matters worse, it's not only an abuse of power, but on top of that, it's inefficient. And so now you've got a level of inefficiency that is so beyond ridiculous. And and now you're abusing the power with inefficiency. I'm done. I'm done. I am am actually finished. I I cannot take it. It drives me. But I'm like, there's nine ways to do this better, Eugene. Like, there's no way this is the right way. Who said said to do that? uh, Let me not. uh, Okay. I'm not good at waiting. I'm not. I'm not good at waiting. I, I'm not. But, but as I've become a Christian, I realize that there are certain things that I can't be victims to. Because I don't like it doesn't mean I can become a victim of it. Whew. You know, we've got many Christians that become victims of their personality. And I cannot become a victim of my personality as a Christian. I must lay my life down before God and become what God has called me to do. But there's so much good news about waiting in the Bible. And the reality of it is, if you are a Christian, you will learn to wait. Because I have never seen God do anything great that did not require waiting. Hello? I have never seen something incredible, a move of God happen without waiting. Waiting is part of the process. But what I want to do for you today is we're going to have kind of a memory verse or a verse that we're going to use throughout this series, and I believe that it's going to help us greatly. But I want to go to Romans 8 real quick and read to you in the message translation what the spiritual world says about waiting. Because you don't have to turn there. I'm going to put up on the screens. I want you to stay in Mark 10. But, But what I want to do for you is that there's a world's waiting and then there's the words waiting. Hello? There's, there's the world's waiting, and then there's God's way of waiting. And I want to talk to you right now, and I want to transform us by the renewing of our ma- mind, the changing of our mind, to think not the way that the world thinks, but to think the way that God thinks about waiting. And I want to read to you what the Apostle Paul says, and I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrased translation of this in the message, and he says this in Romans 8. All around us, we observe a pregnant creation. So, so right there, Paul is saying we are pregnant with something that's growing. Cre- creation is growing. It feels like many of us, if we w- scroll, we think creation is dying, creation is losing the plot. But if you look not with natural eyes but spiritual eyes, Paul the Apostle says all, cre- all around us we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We are also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for a full deliverance. How many of you, some of you are believing God for a full deliverance? For example, I'm praying for a deliverance from the airport. That is why, oh, this is good. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. Woo! What season is it? We're waiting for the arrival of Jesus, right? A woman's giving birth, right? We are, what does it say? Enlarged in the waiting. Oh, man. Can you imagine we get this in our hearts and spirits? Imagine we get, we, we get stronger the longer we wait. What if we grow with anticipation as we wait? What if instead of going, I have suffered so long and been d- diminished, how about in the waiting we grow by the Spirit? And by the way, I'm not saying it's been easy. 
Some of you have been waiting for a miracle for a long time. But I know this about God. Nothing that comes fast is good for us. There's a lot of young people in the room, and we want to get out of seasons and step into our calling prematurely, and I don't believe you should. I believe that God has you in a place of waiting and believing that God can do something great, but just because he showed you what he wants to do for you does not mean he's going to do it right now. Hello, hello, are you with me? Anybody alive this morning? Just because he showed you what he wants to do, do, do you know there are some elderly people that I meet, men in his, their 60s, 70s, 80s, my father included, he started to realize that some of what God had shown him, we, God will not do with him. Woo! He, God's going to do it in his children. And he said to wrestle with ministry and calling for years of what it would look like for God to outwork things because God is not a weekend God. God is a generational God. But we got young people in the room. I'm talking about people in their 20s. And you want things to happen yesterday. And I love you, but it does not happen like that. It takes hard work and dedication. It looks like putting your hand to the plow. It looks like moments of blind Bartimaeus waiting. It looks like seasons when all hell breaks loose. Last night, uh, yesterday afternoon, Noah asked me, she said, Daddy, can you make me a, a, a burrito? I said, absolutely. So I went to the fridge, frozen burrito, pulled it out, opened it up, put it in the air fryer, put it on for seven minutes. Katie told me how to do it. She said, put it in for seven minutes, then bring it out, and then cut it, and then put it back in for another four or five minutes so the middle gets up. Great. So three minutes in, I can't wait. Can't wait. So I pull the burrito out. Three minutes in, not seven, three. You know what I do? I put, take the knife. Oh. Seesaw on the knife. Now I got my hand on top, and I'm see. The knife slips. The burrito goes, explodes. It's like burrito part. My, I almost sliced my hand. You know want to know why I almost sliced my hand? Because I took my food out pre mature and now I am struggling with this meal and I almost cut myself some of you young people you want to get out of it too early you need to stay in the oven you got to stay in the fire you got to stay in it for a little bit longer because you got to believe that God is going to do something, but he can't give it to you prematurely. I'm telling you right now, God is developing something in you in the waiting season. My question for you today is how are you waiting? Are you waiting with fear? Are you waiting with your eyes? Because blind Bartimaeus did, couldn't see with his eyes. Oh, he saw the blindness. Some saw the leprosy and the itching. Some saw the pain. There's a lot of things we see today. We see a lot of anxiety. We see a lot of fear. We see a lot of bank accounts that seem empty or in negative balances. We see a lot of rent that's due. We see a lot of problems with society. We see a lot of issues with our culture. We see, we see, we see. But I got a question for you today. How are you waiting for what God is about to do in and through you? Because because God wants to do something in and through you. How are you waiting for what God is about to do? You know, and it's funny. As this season approaches, um, we got the holidays coming up. Who loves TV shows? Wow, I thought more of you would be in a TV. No, who likes TV shows? Anybody? Okay. I'll help Elisa. 30. I got a great TV show for you. Apple TV. I'm going to give you a show. I'm going to make a show recommendation right now. If you don't get anything today, be like, man, I didn't like that church, but I got a great show recommendation. <laughs> Lessons in chemistry. Anybody see it? Oh, hey, raise your hand. It's okay. Raise your hand. Okay, we got, we got some. Oh, man, it's, it's amazing. Lessons in chemistry. I got a great, that's a great show. You want a holiday show? It's a great one. I, my wife and I, I mean, it's supposed to, listen, I, I, I have, people around the world call me to ask me about my shows. I'm not joking. I'm just saying I don't. I have a bragged a lot here. I'm telling. I'm good at picking. I, I know a good show. I could tell you top five shows ever created. I can't do that right now in front of everyone. Okay. So 
lessons in chemistry, it's unbelievable. But there's this moment in lessons in chemistry where the scientist mother goes and looks at her daughter and says to her, when they're going to find out information about their father who has passed away, he goes up to his daughter and she looks at him and he says, okay, now I want you, because she's a scientist, I want you to lower your expectations that nothing might happen in this meeting. I don't want you to overestimate what could happen here. So this way you won't be disappointed. And I was like, whew, man, it's tough. You know, I've been reading a lot of things about raising children. I read books all the time about raising. I'm reading a book called uh, Household Habits. I'm loving it right now about raising. If you love raising your kids healthy, I want to be the best father I can. I want to grow my kids. And, and I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning. And you know, there's a lot of science and data out there that would tell us that we should actually really not put um, high hopes in situations for our children. Honestly, there is, there's actual scientific data right now. And I love science because over time, I believe it ultimately points to God. But I always have to look at what the world is telling me to do up against what God is telling me to do. You know, Warren Buffett's uh, like right-hand investor died. You know who Warren Buffett was? Berkshire Hathaway. He, and I was reading about him a little bit. And I found out that even in him, he said investing, in investing, he was talking about, I don't get too overexcited and I actually lower my expectations when investing in a company to underestimate how it will perform so hopefully it will outperform. I kind of like that mindset from investing. But I want to tell you that what the world does with its life does not mean what we should do with our lives. Hello. And, and you got to be really careful to what you subscribe to. And I think there's a lot of Christians, you have lowered your expectations, not believing that God can do what only God can do. And I believe that this is a season that we should lift our expectations. Look at your neighbor and say, lift your expectations. Have more faith in this season. Believe that God can do anything. I want to give you three things to do while we wait. Is that okay? And I'm done. Are you guys enjoying this? You want to bounce? You guys want to leave? You want to go watch that show? Should we watch it in church? Number one, while I wait expectingly, I will not be silent. Hmm. Let, 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 let's go to the Bible. We got to go to the Bible. And I just want, I, I'm going to preach it like I see it, but let's go to Mark 10. What do we read? What does it say? Many rebuked him. And told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. I think this is so interesting because when I read it, I started evaluating the scripture. So when I spend some time in the scripture, I think about what's the context? Where are they? Where are they headed? What's going on? And as I read it, I thought about the first line in the, the Mark 10. What does Mark 10 verse 46 say? Well, somebody tell me what it says. Then they came to where? Jericho. What did they tell them not to do? What, what, did, what did the people in the story tell them thousands of years later? What did they tell them not to do? They told them not to what? Shout. When was the last time I remember hearing about Jericho? Hmm. That's why it's important to read your Bible. So we're talking about years, hundreds of years. We're talking, I, 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 don't, I didn't do a study where it was, 700, 800,000 years ago. But you got a massive amount of time. The last time I remember Jericho was in Jericho, in, in Joshua 6, when, when the Bible says that, that, that the men of God, the women of God, were be there was something between the promise of God and the people of God. And there was a wall. And there were walls in Jericho, in Joshua 6, that were surrounding this city, Jericho. And it was fortified, and they could not get in. So what God had them do was march around the walls seven times. And there was an entire process to this. There was a lot of waiting. They crossed over the Jordan, God assembled them, he got them ready, and he had them wait. And what I love about this scripture is I read, I read it, I, I just love the detail that Mark gives us. He goes, then they came to Jericho, and they, and they had a man there, and he was being told not to shout. I can't believe that God connects these dots for us, that he shows us, hey, don't stop shouting. I wanted you shouting in the Old Testament, and I want you shouting 
in the New Testament. I wanted you shouting the day after I resurrected, and I want you shouting on December, what is it? 3rd, 2023. I still want my people shouting. And the enemy and the world and everything around you is going to tell you to be silent. But I don't think we should be waiting silently. I believe that we should be waiting expectingly. And some of you have just been too quiet about what you are believing God for. Oh, I feel like God spoke to me this morning. Hey, let them know. Stop being quiet what you're believing God for. Some of you recently, I know, on social media, I've watched you do it, and I'm proud of you, and I want you to know I am. Some of you are believing God for healing, and you made it public, and you said, this is really hard for our family, but we made it public that we're believing God from healing from cancer. I love that you're not being silent. There are some of you, you're saying, I'm believing for a baby. We don't have the finances. We don't have the wherewithal, but my God. We will not be silent. We're going to put our faith out there. We're going to expect God. There are some of you right now, maybe you got depression, anxiety, fear. Maybe you've been fighting alone. I want to tell you, don't be silent. And you don't need to just go on social media, but find a few friends and say, hey, I need you to pray with me. I need you to believe God with me. You need to start speaking those things that are not as though they were, the Bible says. The Bible says life and death is in the power of the tongue, and we live by its fruit. What are you speaking in life into right now? What marriage is falling apart and you're saying, Jesus, I need you. Son of David, have mercy. Jesus, God, help us right now. You need to start to speak what you are believing and expecting God to do. Are you with me? Number two, while I wait expectingly, I will re respond with prayer. Man, Matthew 7, Jesus tells us, he says, keep knocking. Don't take no for an answer. We, we read in James 5, 16, I know some of the women in our church are going through the book of James right now. It says in James 5, 16, the fervent, effectual prayer avails much. Do you know there's something about God I need you to know? You read throughout the scripture, God likes his people knocking. He likes his people asking. He likes the repetitive nature of us coming to him over and over again and saying, I will not take no for an answer. Why does God do that? Because he's cruel? No, he's trying to see if we really want what we're praying for. He's trying to see if this thing really should matter to us as much as it should. And some of you have been in a fire. And some of you have been even blind. You cannot see your way out of this circumstance. But God wants you praying. And God wants you believing. You know there are some times I have no sight. I can't see in front of me. I'm telling you right now with this church, I can't see what the future holds. God's given me visions from time to time about our church so far. But you know what he's given me? i sorry, you know what? He, he, I haven't had sight sometimes, but you know what I have had? Vision. Sight and vision are two different things. Sometimes you can see what to do next, but sometimes you just got vision. And do you know where you get vision? You get vision in prayer. When you can't see, you get quiet, you get into a dark place, and you start to cry out to God, and you say, God, I need to begin to have vision. I want to read you a quote by Helen Keller. The only thing that is worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. It is so crazy how we will all of a sudden start to not see something and then say, my God, my life is falling apart. I'm broken. I can't do this. I believe today God doesn't want to restore some of just your sight. I believe he wants to give you vision. And you get vision in prayer. You get vision when you're seeking God. What are you bringing to God today? Come on, I'm, I'm asking you. I'm asking you to think. Don't just look at me. What are you asking God to do? You need to bring it to God in prayer. You're not going to get vision for your life if you're not praying. Some of you are like, oh, I'm a pastor. I need to talk. I need a coffee. I need a coffee. I need to go to rest and have a coffee. Hey, so this is going on. Go. Okay, do you pray? No. Okay. You got to pray. It's not funny. It's, it's so, I'm, I, I, you don't know how real this is. You don't pray. I, 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 pray, I pray sometimes. P pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. Don't be silent and open your mouth and start to pray. What do I pray? Thank you, Jesus. 
son of David, have mercy on me. Find something in the scripture that somebody else prayed and just pray it. Just repeat it over and over again. Find a promise and stand on it. Believe God like Joshua did. Once he took him, this is so interesting, once God took him into the promised land, he then had battles for him to fight. Think about that. You think just because you entered a promise means you got no more battles? (laughs) oh oh and you don't know this too let me talk to you about blessing real quick let me talk to you about blessing you know the bigger the blessing the bigger the burden oh you don't know you don't know some of you don't understand the more I got sometimes I'm standing here I was standing here about 10 months ago and God said to me the church is about to grow like crazy again get ready you know what I felt sober because I've been around blessing long enough to know it's not just fun and games it comes with a burden It becomes a burden to pray, a burden to stand, a burden to sacrifice, a burden to lay things down. Come on, are you with me? I believe that this is a season that God is calling us. Hey, you got something in your life, your heart that you're believing God to do? Well, guess what? You're going to have to carry a blessing and burden. And it's going to feel heavy at times. It's going to feel like it's weighing you down at times. But I believe with all my heart that God wants to bless you. But it might look like you carrying a burden for a little while. And that burden is not a bad thing. It's a good thing because the Bible says that God works all things out for his good. And some of you are like, I didn't ask for this cancer. I didn't ask for this sickness. God, where are you? I don't see you. You might not see him, but you can have vision for what he's about to do in your circumstance. And the only place you get vision is in prayer. I mean, Holy Spirit, powerful vision for your life. If you are lacking vision, it is because you are lacking prayer. Oh, do you have some deeper for us? No, I don't. It's the deepest thing I could say today. It's the best thing I could tell you. Get on your knees and pray. Believe God. Trust God. No, no, no. You you try to exit too quickly and then you settle. You settle instead of sacrifice because you have forgotten to pray. But I love blind Bartimaeus. This man, he has no sight, but my God, he's got vision. And he knows who's showing up right now. Hello? He knows who's coming right now. He knows who's around. In John 4, 26, I, I've been surfing with some of my, I, surfing, I've been soaping with some of my young surfer friends. And, and we, we're going through the book of John together right now. And this was our scripture this week in the message. It says in John 4, 26, I am he, Jesus said. You don't have to wait. Say it with me. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. Woo! I, I love that. I read that. I was like, yeah, I am he, Jesus said. Say, somebody say, I am he. It's not you, it's him. I am he, Jesus said. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. Now, I want to be very clear that what Jesus is saying is saying, what you ju- you ju- you're, you're contradicting yourself. You said we don't have to wait. You have, we have to wait. But that says we don't have to wait. No, you don't have to wait for him. you don't have to wait for him oh but you gotta wait for the blessing you gotta wait for the promise you gotta wait for the deliverance because creation is pregnant it is there's a kingdom coming oh you know i don't come to church because i don't see the signs and wonders of the church the way it should oh well join the crowd We are waiting with expectation. But my question today is, do we have a church that's waiting with expectation? Because I'm going to tell you something. You can't execute that which you don't expect. You can't expect 2024 to be a year of executing goals if you are not expecting in 23. And I'm telling you right now, this church will leave 2023, if it's the last thing I do, with some expectation on the inside of them. Believe in God, he's going to do something great in 24. But I don't want your business plan. I don't want your thoughts and ideas without the belief that God can do anything right now. I'm believing God not to do what I want to do. I'm believing God to do what only he can do. Are you with me? Freddie, please come up here and make this sound more spiritual. Please. What is number one? I will wait expectantly and I will not be silent. Number two. 
While I wait expectantly, I will respond with prayer. I will respond with prayer. Jesus, help us. Jesus, help us. Son of David, have mercy on us. Mercy on me, he says. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. Many, many. You know what I found the older I get? It's not a few people hating anymore. It's many. You know what I find in my life now? It's not a few people telling me to shut up. I find many people telling me to shut up. I don't just find a few people doing it anymore. When I was younger, it was a few. The older I get, it's become many. Scripture is a good reminder because, you know, when it was many, I used to second guess myself. It's like, man, you know, maybe I got to check my own heart. Am I doing the right thing? Because it's many. You know, you, you do. You do. Get around some advisors. Get some wisdom around. You got to ask that question. It's an important question. But I think some of you have been quiet just because it's been overwhelming. And I don't care if it's a many. I don't care if it's a million. I don't care if it feels like everyone. You do not stop shouting and you do not stop praying. You keep believing God that he can do anything. Number three, I will wait with vision, expecting to see the light. I was doing a study on blindness. I was talking to somebody, another pastor about blindness. And he told me that he was listening to some stuff about blind people. It's so interesting, but do you know blind people, some of them do see things. And, and the only thing that most blind people will tell you that they see is they see light. That sometimes it's, it's, it's in the darkness, they'll see flashes of it. They'll enter a room and light. If somebody were to go blind and then see for the first time, the first thing they get is light. In the beginning, God said, let there be. You see, God is a God of creation. And God's trying to get our eyes open so that we would see the, the light. And it's not just natural, it's, it's supernatural. God is trying to get you to see the light. And, and, and the light is found in His Word. The Bible says His Word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. You see, you don't have vision because you don't spend time in prayer and you don't spend time in the Word of God. And that is why right now I am dedicated as your pastor to getting you to spend time in the Word of God, in an atmosphere full of worship and in a place and season of prayer. I don't want you to come to church so you tithe. I'm going to say it straight up. I don't need you to come here so you give you money. We need people to give. There's no doubt about it. But that's not why I want you here. I want you in here because I want you in the Word of God. Do you hear me? If you love me and you call this church home, I need you to get in the Word of God. If you are frustrated and anxious, it's because you are not in the Word of God enough. If you are sad and brokenhearted and you don't know where to turn, you need to turn to prayer. You're going to scroll today, and they're going to give you 9 million life hacks. And I'm telling you, they're not, going to start, they're not going to do what the Word of God will do for you. It will change you. We need something ancient, not something new. We need something fresh, not new. And freshness comes from the Word of God. Do you know how many times I've turned the pages of this book, and I have found something fresh that I needed in this season? You know what happened with blind Bartimaeus? Blind Bartimaeus found Jesus, and when he said, come to him, and I love, and I could get into it, but the very people that rebuked him were the people that Jesus sent them to go get him. That's a whole other conversation for another day. But he's wearing a cloak, and that cloak, the Bible says, Mark again, Mark is giving us details that are important. He's wearing a cloak, and that cloak he says what to do with that cloak in the Bible would say um, blind Bartimaeus did he took the cloak off he threw it off what was that cloak he was lonely in context if you were if you were blind in that day it meant you were a sinner it meant you did something to deserve the judgment and the wrath of God so blind Bartimaeus was not only was not only sick with blindness he was also a sinner according to everyone around him which left him lonely on the side of a street and the only thing that kept him warm was that cloak he wore that cloak he put it on at night and during the day he would lay it on the ground and that's where he would collect all of the items that people would drop off as he begged and so when he took that cloak he took off his old identity he took off who he was and he didn't even get to Jesus yet before God healed him he didn't even get rid of the thing that held him before God saved him and God healed him he just said I'm going he called me so I'm going so he throws his cloak off and he goes to God and Jesus and he goes up to Jesus and Jesus asks him what what does Jesus ask him 
What do you want from me? My God. Jesus asked him, what do you want from me? What does he say? I want to see. I think in 2023, God is asking you right now in this room, what do you want from me? Can you answer it? If Jesus walked in the room right now, what would you say? Start to pray it right now. Start to pray it. God, I want this. God, I'm believing for this. Come on. No, don't you don't have to bow your head. You can lift your hands if you want. I want you to say it out loud. God, I want this. Say it quiet if it's personal, but, but say it. Say it. I want this. I want my marriage restored. I want healing from cancer. I want addiction broken in my family. I want generational curses to end. I want God you to do something sovereign. God, I want your anointing to flow. God, I want the Holy Spirit to fall. God, I want revival in my land. God, I want revival in my school. God, I believe in God for you to do. What are you believing? You can't expect God to do anything if you don't have any faith. What are you believing God to do? Not you to do. What are you asking Jesus to do? Oh, come on, saints of God. Come on, saints of God. What are you believing? Throw off your cloak. Millennials, take off the hoodie. Wake up. Get into the bright of the sunlight of the day and start to ask God and start to declare that God is going to do great things because we serve a great God. We serve a God of the impossible. We serve a God that breaks chains. We serve God while there was death all around, sent his own very son. We serve that kind of God. We serve a supernatural God. I'm not just preaching in this room. I'm preaching to thousands. Oh, come on, church. You better cheer right now. I'm not just preaching in this room. I'm preaching to the thousands that will get saved in and through this room. I'm believing God for something greater than I see right now. How about you? Oh, I don't prepare for this room, Freddie. I prepare for the thousands that will receive Jesus through your life. I'm not just preparing for Tuesday. I'm preparing for the next decade. Oh, church, what are you expecting in this season? Do we live day to day for ourselves? But what are you believing God for? What are you pregnant with? What is growing on the inside of you? Oh, it's so hard though, John. I've tried to believe before. If I believe again, it might break my heart. I know. But Jesus is here now. And you've turned another page in the book. You're not where you were yesterday. Don't believe that lie. Yeah, you're still in Jericho. But this time, Jesus is walking through. Yeah, we're still in Waimanalo, but now Jesus is walking through. Yeah, you're still in that marriage, but now Jesus is walking through. Yeah, you're about to make some big life changes, but now Jesus is walking through. Yeah, you're, you're going to rehab, but Jesus is walking through. Yeah, you're, you're going to get that, 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 that diagnosis, but man, Jesus is walking through. Yeah, you're going to the doctors again, but Jesus is walking through. Yeah, you're taking that pain medication again, but now Jesus is walking through. Yeah, you're going to that situation again, but now Jesus is walking through. Yeah, you're entering your school again, but now Jesus is walking through. It's everything begins to change when Jesus walks through. And I just want to tell you this. Who healed this man? Who healed him? Who healed him? What healed him? You, oh, you know. I thought I had some great ending. I'm going to say something potentially controversial. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Who, what healed this man? It was not Jesus. Who healed him? What healed him? Who healed him? What healed him? Who? What? So many of you, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But you have no expectancy. You have no faith. Who? Yeah, it's Jesus, but he hasn't done it. Where's your faith? Where's your vision? You got to be expecting. God is about to fill us with faith. Are you ready? Who in this room says, I need more faith? I, I need more. I'm going to tell you right now. I got my hand up. I need more faith. If you need more faith, I want you to stand to your feet. I'm, I'm going to pray for the people. And you can pray. If you want to sit, you can. But I'm going to ask you to pray for the people that need more faith. I need more faith. I need more faith. 
I need more faith. Can you lift your hands to heaven? This is the general sign of surrender. That's why we do it. We don't do it because people tell us to. This is how we surrender. God, we need you. Jesus, I pray in the name of the heavenly Father that we serve, the God of heaven and earth, God, that you would fill your people with great expectancy and great faith today. God, faith that will move mountains. God, faith that can face the facts of life and still trust you anyway. God, today we pray for healing in this house. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would do it now. God, that you would heal. We don't have to look any further. We don't have to go anywhere else. Jesus, you are all that we need. We thank you that you are healing in this room. God, that you are restoring in this room. And that faith is coming to your people even right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hands down, hands down, really quickly, really quickly. If you are in here and you're like, okay, I don't know who Jesus is. I've never followed Jesus. I don't know who that is. I just, I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes one more time. If you're in here and you're like, man, you know what? I need Jesus. I, I don't know that I've asked Jesus to be my Lord. I don't know that I've asked to be my Savior. I, I don't know where I'd spend eternity, heaven or hell. I don't know if I died today, where to, what, I, where, what tomorrow would hold. I, I'm so afraid. I don't know what to do. Well, the first step is to just receive Jesus. So if you are in here and you are overwhelmed by life and you maybe ran away from Jesus, but it's your day to come back to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand right now and I'm going to pray for you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. I see your hand. I thank you, Jesus. I think if your heart is beating out of your chest and you're not sure about God, God is sure about you. You can join these people with their hands lifted. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to say this together as a church family as we do every single week. Would you say this with me? Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I want to follow you. I make you Lord. Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, I pray for my family. I pray for my own life. Save everyone around me. Heal me from the inside out. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us today online. I want to take a moment. I want to speak to the people who just decided to follow Jesus. We want you to know that is the greatest decision you can possibly make. And we as a church family, we are here to help you on that journey. Just below me, there's a link. It says, I have decided to follow Jesus. You can click on that and get next steps. Our encouragement to you is find a local church, a community of faith that can come around you and inspire you and encourage you on the amazing journey of following Jesus. I also want to take a moment and thank our giving community, those who financially support this vision so that we can be a family and help people find faith in Jesus Christ. We love you so much, church. Thank you, and we'll see you back here next week.